It ain't the left side or the right side. Then it must be the fence side. side. It ain't the left side. Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode of On the Fin Side here with Kat and Paul. You can join us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and on Spotify. Also, check out our merch store on the fin side, adoptthreadless.com. The Miami Dolphins play the Indianapolis Colts this weekend, 325 Central Time, 425 Eastern Time in Indianapolis. The Colts right now are seven and a half point favorites, and we're lucky enough to be joined by Brad Wells. You can follow him at Brad Wells NFL on Twitter. He is our Colts correspondent, and he gives us a lot of insight for the Indianapolis Colts. He's joining us from, I believe, Vancouver. Uh, thanks for joining us here today, Brad. Yes, in, in, in lovely, overcast, rainy Vancouver. It's great this time of year. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Brad, the last time I think we did this, uh, gosh, it's been a couple of years. I think Bjorn Warner yeah. was a up-and-coming promising player yeah. and Hugh Thornton was an up and coming promising offensive lineman. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been a couple of years here, but the Colts have really turned the page here in the last four games. They're on a four game winning streak, averaging 36 and a half points a game. Is this more reflective, this four game winning streak, is it more reflective of the Colts playing well, Andrew Luck, or is it kind of the opponents they've played over the last four games? I'm, I'm going to say that it's the opponents, uh, but it is a combination of both. But I think the opponents are, are definitely at play. I mean, I, I did the, the math the other night, and I, the opponents that they've played over the last four games are all outside of the Titans, obviously. Um, they all have losing records. I think the surprising one is Jacksonville. I think everyone expected Jacksonville to get back, to be, to be the same type of team they were last year, which was about a, a 10 or 11 win team. But they're, they have really sunk into the into the bottom half of the league. And then the other two teams that they played, when they were really on the ropes after a, a really bad loss to the Jets, uh, just that was their lowest point. They were one and five and just looked terrible. And then they were gifted the Buffalo Bills, uh, who had lost uh, their quarterback, um, Allen, and they had to sign Derek Anderson off the street. And the Bills just were, were terrible and still are. And uh, the Colts won that game, and then they got, they got to face the Oakland Raiders, who have been in full tank mode since week two. Um, and then they beat them, and I think that gave them some confidence, uh, which they really desperately needed because after that Jets loss and they were one and five, this looked like one of the worst teams in football, even with Andrew Luck. And Andrew Luck has played well all season long, and despite his strong play and despite the good coaching of Frank Reich, uh, the Colts just did not – they just weren't very good. They didn't look very talented. And uh, these last four games, they've uh, definitely looked much better. Uh, against the Titans, they looked fantastic. But even with the Titans game, there were some extenuating circumstances that I think kind of skew that win a little bit. But the fact of the matter remains, they are 5-5, five and five, uh, and uh, they are 5-5 five and five because they are playing well right now. So let's look at their personnel here. Obviously, the big changes on offense took place largely in the offensive line. They drafted Quentin mm -hmm. Nelson in the first round. They drafted Braden Smith in the second round, kicked him out to right tackle. They also picked up uh, Mark Lewinsky off the street for basically nothing. And Andrew Luck has not been sacked in the last 214 dropbacks. Yeah, they're, they're playing very well. I mean, I think that right now, if you were to look at the offensive line, the best offensive lineman they have right now is Mark Lewinsky. And he was picked up off waivers last year by the Seahawks, from the Seahawks. And Glowinski just did not play well for Seattle. And, uh, you know, it, it seems that uh, when Tom Cable is your offensive line coach, nobody plays well in Seattle when Tom Cable was coaching there. Um, now Cable's with the Raiders, and the Raiders' offensive line isn't that good. Glowinski came to Indianapolis. Um, he's doing very well uh, with the new offensive line coach uh, who comes from the New England Patriots. There was some controversy in Indianapolis about um, – the Colts bringing in uh, that offensive line coach whose name escapes me. I just know him by his nickname, which is Goog. Um, John something. Goog is just how I know him. Whoever it was, and I'm he, pretty sure he was the former Dolphins offensive line assistant. <laughs> but I, I, well, they got rid of – well, uh, this will be funny. Their former offensive line coach for the last two years, so last year when the Colts gave up somewhere – like 56 sacks 
Their offensive line coach was Joe Philbin. Huh. Well, that doesn't surprise us. Yes. I got news for you. Joe Philbin's head, headset's not even plugged in half the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Philbin, Joe Philbin, God bless him. I'm sure he's a nice guy. He's a bad coach. I, I'm, I, I'm just going to throw – this is nothing personal. I don't know Joe Philbin from Adam, but I saw the coaching job he did in Miami. I saw the coaching job with the offensive line did with the Indianapolis Colts. He's not good. And I, I know met, that uh, – Yeah, I've met Joe before, and very, very nice guy. Felt like meeting my grandpa. Uh, it's, it's that <laughs> simple. Uh, he's, I yeah, mean – Believe me, you're preaching yeah. to the choir with us Dolphins fans. So yeah. yeah. So without, they, 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 they've, changed, they've changed their offense. They've changed their offensive. They changed their offensive line coach, and that certainly helps them. Um, bringing in talented players like Nelson and Smith and Glowinski certainly helps. But I think the one thing to factor in here with Indianapolis is, is that they've spent three first-round picks and a high second-round pick on their offensive line. Now, most teams in the NFL who have good offensive lines don't have to do that. And you shouldn't have to do that. If you've got a general manager who's worth anything, that general manager will be able to find guards and centers and maybe one tackle in the lower rounds of the draft. You look at a team like the Patriots, you look at a team like the Eagles from last year. Um, These teams, you look at a team like the Rams right now, they're able to find quality players along the offensive line later in the draft or off of the scrap heap. The Colts have had to invest a significant amount of draft capital, and in my opinion, too much draft capital in the offensive line just to make it good. And so, yeah, it is playing very well right now, but the reality is it darn well should be playing well now because that's a lot of first-round picks. Speaking and, of um, one of those first-round first, picks, mm-hmm. Ryan Kelly is ex- is going to miss this game. How do you think that's going to impact the offensive line? I think it will impact it significantly. I don't think it's going to crumble to dust, but Kelly is the one who makes all of the line calls. Uh, the coaches in Indianapolis say that Ryan Kelly is the linchpin of the offensive line. Um, I, I think his replacement, I've forgotten his name, I want to say it's Eric Bomer or something like that, some guy I've never heard of. Um, but, I mean, you know, he'll be ready. The, the, the coaching staff in Indianapolis, their offensive coaches in particular, they get the team, unlike the previous coaching staff, they get the team ready to play every Sunday. So I, I think the Colts' offensive line will be good. But missing Kelly is a significant injury. And if, if you're the Dolphins, that's an injury. That's a, that's, a, that's a missing player right there that you need to exploit that. You bet. And let's look at the, the weapons Andrew Luck has on offense, too. T.Y. Hilton had a massive game last time. I had him in fantasy football last year, and it seemed like he'd either get 15 (laughs) yards or 170 every game. And it seems like that's kind of the case this year, too. He's got 585 yards on the season, six total touchdowns, but he is somebody that can get deep at any time. How do you see Andrew Luck spreading the ball around in this game? Well, you mentioned Hilton. Hilton's a little bit of a one-trick pony. Um, Obviously very fast. He can get over the top of the defense, as he did with the Titans last week. Big play guy. But uh, he's the type of player that if the defensive coaching staff is smart, you want to take Hilton out of the game, all you got to do is jam him. Jam Hilton, get physical with Hilton, you won't see Hilton the rest of the game. He's not a physical receiver. He doesn't really respond well to physical play. And every every time you watch Hilton, you, you give Hilton a free release, that's that's just basically handing the Colts yards. If you're physical with him, you get up in his face, you jam him at the line of scrimmage, you don't give him a free release, then it's much, much harder uh, for Hilton to get involved in the game, which is why Hilton's productivity this year has been very hot and cold as it was last year. Where the Colts have really thrived uh, personnel-wise has been the use of their tight ends. And their tight ends have played exceedingly well. And, again, the creativity of Frank Reich as head coach and offensive coordinator, he calls the plays on Sunday, he's, he's done such a fantastic job of scheming with routes and with protection and giving luck freedom at the line of scrimmage to really get those tight ends free up the seam. Eric Ebron's a great example of it. And the running backs as well. 
because really outside of Hilton, the Colts wide receiving core stinks. Just flat stinks. A lot of drop balls, uh, a lot of sloppy route running, just not a very good wide receiving core. So it's the type of thing where Reich has been very good at getting his tight ends free. But if you're going to be a defense that's going to slow the Colts down, you've got to find a way to, to run with those tight ends. And you also sure. have to find a way of getting some kind of pressure on Andrew Luck. I mean, he's been so – the offensive line has played very well the last four weeks, but really a lot of the credit for not getting sacked goes to Andrew Luck. He has just become so much better at feeling, feeling pressure, feeling heat, stepping up in the pocket not making stupid decisions and not running and then lowering his head and stuff like that, that he used to do in his early days, sliding. That's that, a lot of that is Andrew Luck. He deserves a lot of credit for not being sacked. Let's move on to the defensive side of the ball. There's been obviously a lot of changes over there over the last couple of years. I mean, really everybody, I, I can't recall mm -hmm. a defender off the top of my head. That's been there for the last two years because there have been so many switches. A couple of observations looking at the Colts defense. Last two games, Leonard Fournette and Deion Lewis combined in those two games for 2.26 yards a carry. So obviously they've been doing very well against the run. And on in terms of their passing defense, one thing that jumps out for me for a pass defense that ranks pretty well, or at least average to above average in the league, is they're allowing 72% of passes to be completed against them. What is your mm -hmm. overall analysis of the Colts defense? Well, it's not very good. I, <laughs> and, and I think the reason why it's not very good is there's not a lot of money invested in it. Their secondary is horrible. Their corners are not particularly good. Their safeties are not particularly good. Their, their safeties are okay. I mean, Malik Hooker is a first-round pick from uh, 2017, and he struggled to stay healthy. When he's been out there, he's been good, but uh, they expected him to be kind of like a ball hawk type safety, and he really hasn't been that. And part of the reason why is because he's had trouble staying healthy. Uh, Clayton Gethers, uh, he's another guy that they expected to be good. He's got a significant neck injury that he's been coming back from, so they had to go out and sign Mike Mitchell, who's played well for them. Again, their corners their corners are, you know, high-effort guys. They're, they're fine. You know, uh, Pierre Desir, I think, is their, is their best one. He's a nice corner to have, but none of these guys – None of these guys are shut down people. And then the defensive front, they really struggle to get any pressure on the quarterback. So that's why quarterbacks are able to complete a high percentage of throws because nobody's getting anywhere near them. Against the run, it's been interesting because I think overall, as you said, that they've been pretty, pretty good against the run. But I always find that to be a bit of a mirage because in the modern NFL, as we saw – you know, last Monday night with the Rams and the, the Chiefs, running the football just isn't the premium anymore. you got to be able to throw, and you throw to set up the run these days. And the Colts struggle to rush the quarterback. They struggle to cover. But they do have one guy that right now as a rookie is a bona fide playmaker, and that's Darius Leonard. And he's, he's legit. You know, I'm very critical of the Colts' front office. But I think that that draft pick of Darius Leonard, uh, outside linebacker for them, he has been absolutely phenomenal. He is a rookie of the year candidate, no question about it. And he is exceedingly good at getting key turnovers or generating key turnovers at key moments in the game. So if you're an opposing offensive team, you got to know where Leonard is on the field and you've got to make sure that you can contain him because he's, he's very, very good as a rookie. So, Brad, what do you think the Colts have to do to win this game? Well, I think they've got to do what they've done the last couple of – last four weeks. I don't really think their formula needs to change. I think they've got to protect Andrew Luck. I think Luck's got to get the ball to the tight ends. I think it's going to be difficult this week because the Colts only have two healthy tight ends entering this game. So that's something to watch. It will be interesting to see if Luck tries to get the ball to Hilton more, as he did against the Titans. So if you're the Dolphins, I think what you do is you get physical with Hilton – and you let Luck, you know, dump the ball over the middle to his tight ends, but you've got to find some way to pressure Luck. And I think you have to pressure him up the middle. And maybe with Kelly being out, that's the primary way that you can do it. 
if you're Indianapolis, I think you got to do everything you can to this, this new guy they're going to have at center. You got to do everything that you can to protect him, uh, which might mean that you have to keep Nelson you know, in the interior more and Nelson going out and pulling maybe fewer pulls. I don't know, but you've got to do everything you can to make sure that that, uh, that guy is not the weakest link on offense and on defense. You know, I think Tannehill's going to play this week. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, he's he'll be back for the first time in a while, and yeah. who knows how that's going to go? I mean, we're just excited that he's back in the lineup because Osweiler's been so bad. But mm-hmm. that that shoulder could, or excuse me, that uh, that labrum that he's got, that injury that he has, we're hoping that's going to hold up. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound too much different from Andrew Luck's injury. You know, he had a labrum or shoulder right. injury as well. So. So and it, it, with Luck, it took him a long time to heal from it. But part of that was also because of Luck himself. He, he tried to rush back too quickly and didn't rehab effectively enough, which is one of the main reasons why he was out for an entire year, not necessarily because of the severity of the injury. I think if you're the defense, to answer your previous question, I think if you're the defense, I think you have to blitz more. I think you got to go after Tannehill. He's been out for a while, got the shoulder. Let's see if he can. And, and you know, Tannehill, I have nothing against Tannehill. I think he's kind of had a little bit of a raw deal with the Dolphins. I think it's only been recently that he's had a coach in Adam Gase that can, that he can work with. And it's just been difficult to see him with knee injury and now with shoulder injury. He's like he's being robbed of a chance to finally work with a good coach on offense. Yeah, that's but, the frustrating you know, thing uh, mm-hmm. from our side. Yeah. The, as soon as they get Adam Gase in, I mean, Ryan Tannehill is about to go 9-5 and five and lead his team to the playoffs. And then mm-hmm. he hurts his knee. They rush him back. He hurts his knee again the next year. Then he has this labrum, and it feels like they're rushing him back again. But if he sits out the year and rehabs it correctly, they've got a major decision of whether or not they're going to cut him or not. So, you know, it's it has been kind of – the timing just hasn't been there so far with Tannehill, that's for sure. Yeah, it, it's and it, it's another example that we see in this league of if you've got a guy that's got talent, I think when Tannehill's drafted the same year that Andrew Luck was drafted, and just like Andrew Luck and just like Robert Griffin III, these guys just were put in franchises and put with coaches who didn't know what the heck they were doing. And they tr- they did not treat these guys. They did not coach these guys. They did not develop these guys the way that they should have. And as fans of football, whoever you are, you've been you've kind of been robbed, really, of talented people. Think of how great Robert Griffin III would have been if he didn't have morons in Washington uh, basically blow out his knee. Think of how great Andrew Luck would have. Andrew Luck might have won a couple of MVPs right now had he not had Chuck Pagano and Rob Chudzinski coaching him and Ryan Tannehill. If, if Tannehill had had somebody like Adam Gates since the very beginning, I think Ryan Tannehill, you know, we would see more Dolphins teams winning the AFC East than all of these Patriots teams that have won the AFC East. But that's certainly what we all want on that. (laughs) Just 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 goes to show you. Again, the Patriots are a great example of it. When you've got great coaching, it makes all the difference in the world. It really, really does. You bet. Brad Wells joining us here. You can follow him on Twitter at Brad Wells NFL. And uh, Brad, before we let you go. What is your prediction for this weekend? I think I have to go with Indianapolis. I, I don't know if uh, – I think seven and a half is the spread, right? Is it seven or seven Correct. and a half? Is it seven or seven and a half? Oh, excuse me, seven and a half. The spread is seven and a half. I, I, I would say I, – I wouldn't take the Colts with the spread. I think the Colts will win the game, though. I have a lot of misgivings about the Dolphins with Tannehill. And – uh, going on the road too. I, I, this does not look like a game that really, um, in my opinion, stacks up well for Miami. But I would not be surprised if Miami won it. But I, I think Indianapolis will win this game. I think that the matchups favor them, and uh, they're on a bit of a roll right now. So I, I think the Colts go over 500, and the and the Dolphins lose. That will do it for our breakdown of the Colts-Dolphins matchup with Brad Wells. You can join us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and on Spotify. And if it is not on the right side and it's not on the left side, it is on the fin side. Solo D, take us out. It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the fin side. Inside. It ain't the left side, left side or the right, right side. side, and it must be the fin side. Listen, the
Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what Brian Cat and Paul about to do.